remember that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual living. Uh, it's a... Uh, it can't, be, it, can't, it can't be learned nor lived in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. And so in regard to personal sin, what do I have to do? I have to confess it. First John 1 John 1.9, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me. That takes you back to verse 7 in 1 John. It takes you back to 1.7 and the work of Christ on the cross. This is not about salvation. Confession of your sin is not about salvation. It's about spirituality. When Christ died on the cross, he died for Adam's sin, the judicial punishment of Adam's sin that's upon all mankind, Romans 5, 12 through 21. But confession of sin is for the believer. He, Christ's blood cleanses us from that as well. But it's not about salvation for the Christian. It's about spirituality. By that I mean paying attention to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life, both to us and through us. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, mental attitude type sins or sin, overt sins or, uh, or sins of the tongue, just to mention a few like that. If you confess them, then you're back into fellowship with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the dynamics of the Christian life is. I give you a moment. I give you a moment to... As a believer priest, uh, out of First Peter two, to make confession if necessary. Well, our heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have under the banner of freedom within the nation of the United States uh, to publicly and openly in the public square preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and teach the word of God without censorship. The censorship we have upon us today, Father, is not governmental, it's virus. The government is declared in order to fight this virus in a proper way. Uh, we need to be in social isolation or separation. And so, as good people, Father, we have done that. We're battling this through the uh, nearly a month, and now we're in a second month of it. And we pray, Father, that we would learn the lessons from it that we'd have great ministries through it and that we would understand that you're still an awesome God and we need to pay attention to why you've shut down the world. What is your message with that? Encourage our hearts today, Father, through this study of let not your hearts be troubled. Encourage our hearts, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. I know many of you have probably thought about this shutdown you know, sometimes you get shut down in a small place, maybe a community, where some, something is hit. Like maybe around here, we have tornadoes, and it can go through, and it can devastate a, a portion of a community, and things are stalled for temporarily. The community comes together, and first thing you know, we're back in business. You could have a statewide crisis. You could have a war crisis. There are a lot of crises. But I'll tell you, you pay special attention when you realize that we have a virus that shut down the world. When God shuts down the whole world, we should be paying attention. We should really pay attention. And I'll tell you why you should pay attention. Because this threat, this virus, is a life threat. It carries death with it. And so the question is, what is the antidote? What is the, what is the spiritual solution to this threatening, life-threatening virus? The truth of the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only answer to disease and death is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ came into the world to die on a cross for our sins was buried and raised from the dead the third day to give us life everlasting. The only thing that can remove disease and death from your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the greatest of these is death. I mean, what is the people get a disease? If it's life-threatening, they realize it involves death. I ask you the question today, are you confident that if you got the virus and died, 
where would you go? Where would you go? You're going to go somewhere. Believe me when I tell you, you're going to go somewhere. There is life after death. You're going to go somewhere. In the Bible, you're either going to go to hell or to heaven in common layman terms. You're not going to go to heaven apart from the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except through me in John 14, 6. The whole reason God sent his son into the world was over the sin issue of death. The virus is Adam's sin. It struck all mankind. Every human being born is born with this virus, so to speak, of sin death. Romans 5, 12 talks about one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death by sin, and so it spread to all mankind. No matter what you get from our lesson today, the bottom line is you must understand how desperately important, listen, it's not to win the virus, the war on the virus. It is what the virus threatens, sin death. Jesus Christ came to take care of the sin death. That's why John 3.16 says, when you believe, you're no longer perishing, but you have eternal life. I want you to be sure you have confidence in that today. I want you to have confidence in that today. For I believe, this is my opinion, but I believe the reason this is worldwide, this virus that threatens life, is to bring awareness to the unbelievers of the world of the need for the gospel of great salvation. And for the church, it's an alarm for the responsibility of taking the gospel both locally and, and globally. I think it's our responsibility, and I hope that I'm doing that today as this message will go out, not just locally, but will go globally through the Internet. I hope you understand that. I hope you will apply, if you're a believer, that you apply Acts 1-8 or Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Let us go forth and preach the gospel of Christ. No greater time than now, an awakening. The church has always had awakenings. Awakenings. Luther, the Reformation, awakening. We've always had them, and I believe we're in, the, in a, a, an awakening period in our life today, and I hope we're, we respond to it. Now, in regards to my lesson, my lesson is based on the principle of Second, uh, second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed or inspired of God to inhale and exhale, to take it in, to take the Scripture into our life and out of our life, through the faith cycle. And, and, the, and verse 17 says, and, we're, and it equips us for every good work. And so some of the great work that can be done is what we're dealing with in our Wednesday study. And that is great ministry opportunity. This virus has offered us, as, as difficult as it might seem, that we're under social quarantine and distancing, distancing one another. The one place I'm finding that you're not distant is your phones, your internet, mail. I see neighbors speaking across yards today uh, that I've never seen before during the week. It's an, an important principle for us as believers. Now, my lesson today comes from 1 Thessalonians. If you turn there, the first Thessalonians, the fifth chapter in verse 14 is where my lesson comes from. But I want to tell you something important. Text always comes from context. If there's one thing about hermeneutics you learn in ministry is text and context. My text, first, first Thessalonians 5, 14, my text comes from first Thessalonians 5, 12 through 28. Now that's the greater picture. Now I want to tell you that because something's very important here. Here's what you may not see in the English that's important for me to tell you. From verses 12 to 28, the context, there are 17 imperatives. 
Greek imperatives. Those are commands. 16 of them are present imperatives. And one lone one is aorist. Down in verse 25. No, in verse 26. In verse 26 of our, of our context, the word greet. Greet all the brethren is an aorist imperative. Now, I'm going to tell you what that means. When, you, when Paul is running a series of present imper imperatives, and he ran 16 in a row, there are 16 present imperatives here. Those are standing commands to the church. They're standing commands. Nothing, you're always alert to these ministries. He lists 16 out of them in the present tense. Then he wind, takes all these 16s and rolls them up into one aorist tense, greet one another. It's very important you understand that. Now, the last time we met, we dealt with, um, in verse 14, let's see, no, verse 13, last time we met, we were in 1 Thessalonians 5.13, live in peace with one another. And we dealt with, and that's the first present imperative that's given. And they're going to go all the way down. They're going to go all the way down until we get to verse 26, where it's an aorist tense. So we saw this first standing command was to live in peace. And that was our lesson last time. Now, in verse 14, our lesson today there are four things said. There are four more commands. And we urge you, brethren, one, admonish the unruly. And the word admonish, admonish is a present imperative. Encourage the faint-hearted. That's our study today. The word enc encourage is a present imperative. Help the weak. The word help is a present imperative. Be patient is a present imperative. Now, I want you to see that. That's very important that you see that. Now, I jump down here because I'm dealing with a specific series idea, let not your hearts be troubled. So I'm going to avoid dealing today with admonish the unruly. I think I could by people not paying attention uh, to social distancing and things of that nature. But I don't want to do that. I want to spend time with the idea and encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted. Now, I want to show you something that you will miss if you don't pay attention. Notice all four of these are present imperatives. Admonish, encourage, help, and be patient. But what's the problem? The antidote, the antidote for the problem for example, in our text, encourage the faint-hearted. What's the problem? Faint-hearted. What's the antidote? What's the spiritual solution? Encourage. Now, here's what Paul did that's really important. He gave you the antidote before you realized you had the problem. He gave you the antidote before you realized you had the problem. That's really incredible. Why? Because we are to encourage those who are faint-hearted. This is directed to the person who is not faint-hearted, but God wants to have a ministry to the one who is faint-hearted. All four of these are done that way. Admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient. Notice that? Be patient with all men. It's really important you see that because all six of these are offering you in the time of crisis, people have all of these problems of dealing with a crisis in their life. They're unruly. They're faint-hearted. They've become weak. And we are the first liners. You know, we pay attention to the, to the doctors and the medical staff and all those who are on the front line, we say. 
How important are the frontliners? We are the frontliners in a time of crisis. The believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that have a solid foundation of doctrine in their souls are the ones who are the, fr are the front line. We are the ones that to encourage, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and this list goes on. There's 16 different opportunities that Paul discussed with the church. Today, we're going to look at this idea of encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted. I got three points I want to make today be to, enc to encourage you to have ministry to the faint-hearted. You will meet a lot of faint-hearted people today, and I'm going to explain what that means over a crisis. If it's not this one, it will be another one especially when it's life-threatening. So here we go. Point number one. Notice that Paul gave the spiritual solution before addressing the spiritual problem because he wants us to become front-line people. Front-line people who have the antidote to faint-heartedness. Encourage the faint-hearted. And notice that's a present Middle imperative, second person plural. That's a standing command. Always be ready to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in dire circumstances. We're in dire circumstances today. Where is your ministry? Where, where is our ministry? Are you looking for ministry? It's there. It could be, listen, it can be on your cell phone. It can be on the internet. It can be on the telephone. It can be through the mail. Listen, we've got people. Listen, i got people who live in Michigan. Some of them live in Florida. I've got friends all over. They want some answers. And listen, encourage the faint-hearted is our subject today. Paul did this with all four in verse 14. Admonish the ruling, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all people. The spiritual loose solution to faint-heartedness in a time of crisis is encouragement. Now, here's what's... See, when you see the word in the English Bible, encourage, the English word is always going to be encouraged. May not be true in the Greek. May not be true in the Greek. For example... The, the typical word for encourage that people in the church might think would like, well, I have the gift of exhortation. I have the gift of exhortation. That's not the word that's used. That's not the word. That is not the word. Even though you could do that, this is not the word. This is not the word. Notice I wrote this on your paper. It has, it's a compound word, para, along coming alongside, being a helper, being an encourager, coming alongside, muth, and then the word muthaomai, para muthaomai. It is, it, it is used as exhorting. It is used as encouraging, but it's not the gift. I wrote the Greek word for the gift that's listed in Romans 12.8. When the virus hit, I was doing a study on spiritual gifts. Well, I'll resume when the, the virus goes. Right now, I too, as a pastor, am battling the virus with my people. Paracletus is the word. Paracletus is the spiritual gift of exhortation. So you might ask, what is the difference between these two words and the way they operate? Well, paracletus, the spiritual gift of exhortation, is the spiritual spiritual capability and adaptability, listen to those two words, the capability and the adaptability to exhort, encourage, and comfort by the function of a spiritual gift by means of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. These are not able, these, this gift cannot work in the flesh. It is not designed for that. It is designed specifically in a specific way within the body of Christ. That's not our word. Rather, our word, 
parumutheomai involves spiritual growth capacity. A baby believer can't do this. A baby believer would be overwhelmed by a crisis. A baby believer can't do that. An immature believer, he flopping so back so much back and forth, he don't have the stability, even though he could, but he don't have the stability. This is for mature believers who have a stable, confident attitude about the truth of the word of God. It talks about spiritual growth capacity to encourage others, watch this now, to do the right thing scripturally by showing sympathy through comforting speech regarding the truth of categorical doctrine. That's a whole lot of stuff right there. But you come alongside somebody who's faint-hearted, who is struggling with a crisis in their life. And he says, here's what you have the capacity to do. Here's the spiritual capacity to encourage that person to do the right thing scripturally, which is categorical Bible doctrine. What is the right thing spiritually? means what are you faint-hearted about? What is your problem? Bible has an answer. What is your problem? Well, I'm, a, I'm afraid of the virus. Do you have it? No, I'm afraid I might get it. What are you doing? What has the experts told you to do? Here's what they've told me to do. Wash my hands, yada, yada. You know the drill. Okay. Are you still fearful? Yes. Then it's not about that. Then it's not about that. So let's talk a little further because we still don't have what you're fearful of. And so it may have to take some spiritual growth. It may to encourage others to do the right thing scripturally, categorically. You got to fit the scripture with the problem that the person has become faint-hearted over. And as you explain to them, notice this word requires you to have sympathy for what they're going through. You don't jerk them up, and you don't say, straighten up, get, get come on, the, the, quit being a crybaby. That word says, no, you are to console them. You're to offer sympathy, offer soothing words, but yet truth. You can give them truth without banging on them. This is about giving them truth, consoling them in the time of trouble and show them what they have to do to correct it. This is the word that is used. Probably the best word is console, but it deals with how you deal with the person. In 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter of verse 11 and 12, we have a situation where Paul says, he uses three things. He says, exhort, encourage, and witness. And one of those words that was used is our word, paramutheomai. It is the word in the English translator translated encourage. What he's talking about is consoling. 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 And it's used in that passage in second and first Thessalonians as a participle. The best way for me to explain this word to you is in John the eleventh chapter. In John, the 11th chapter, verses 17 through 19 and 30 through 31, we have the death and funeral of Lazarus. Jesus waits, if you remember the story, until Lazarus has been dead four days and the funeral is in when he shows up. The funeral is on when Jesus shows up. And this word is not used with Mary and Martha, nor with Jesus. This word is used with the Jews who have come to a funeral to console the family. In John 17 and 19 and 30 and 31. The Jews in verse 19 had come to the home and then to the funeral to console the sisters. This is brought out again in verse 31. 
in verse 31. It is our word to console. Paul, when he used it in 1 Thessalonians 2, described himself as a parent with a child. And the purpose that he was encouraging, consoling, and witnessing was to get them to walk worthy of the Lord. He used the word to get them to walk worthy of the Lord, if you read it, if you read that text. Now, the second thing. So there's the idea of the word that's used, encourage. It's more technical. I would like to have you think of consoling. The Greek word for faint-hearted. This is a very rare word. This is a, you find it, you, you, this word is hard to find in the Koine Greek. If you, if you were looking this word up, it's rarely used. It's a specialty word for something of great crisis, of a great crisis. It is a compound word. It's made up of oligos, meaning small, and sukos, meaning soul, soulish. And what this refers to, faint-hearted, is a person who has within his own choices and decisions and an emotional breakdown, shrunk his world. He has shrunk his world into a closet. At one time, he had a 12-room home. Now he lives in a closet. Still got a 12-room home. But he lives in a little closet. He's made that choice himself. How did he shrink his world? Paul called it by becoming faint-hearted. This word is best described by a person who's become despondent. Despondent. The stress has become distress that's gone to depression and despondency. That's a faint-hearted person, so that when you find that person, you can identify him. That is the faint-hearted person. He has shrunk. He has shrunk his living existence from a 12-room home to a little closet, like maybe a four-year closet, usually the smaller ones, or the laundry closet where you keep your linen, the linen closet, very small. He has done this himself. He has done this to himself. Listen, sometimes the crisis is real and sometimes it's imaginary. For example, in Exodus, the sixth chapter, verses 6 through 19, the Lord speaks to Moses regarding the Exodus. And he explains to Moses the Abrahamic covenant and why it's time for the Israelites to leave Egypt and go to the promised land. A family went into Egypt, and a nation is going to march out. 430 years after the patriarch family of Jacob went in, a nation... 70 people is going to turn into over 2 million. A family went in and a nation came out. It was time to lead a nation out. And he picked Moses to do it. And he explains to Moses the Abrahamic covenant. Because the freedom that's going to come to the Israelites is the fulfilling of the Abrahamic covenant, the land section. There was a land section, a seed section, and a blessing section of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. Now, he says, I'm going to lead, them, lead my, na my people out of bondage as a nation. We're going to the promised land to become a nation, the priest nation of God. Moses, Moses is troubled by this whole idea 
because the responsibility to do that has been assigned to him. Moses, who had to run away from Egypt for a dispute, killed an Egyptian and had to leave the nation for 40 years. God wants him to go back. You're the man I want to lead. You're the man I've chosen to lead the people. I want to lead them out of bondage. And something interesting in verse 7, for you to know that I am the Lord your God. Moses, you've got to believe that in order for them to believe it. I want the people to know when they leave Egypt, I am the Lord their God. And they're going to see me prove it to them. I'm going to do such miracles in their life that it won't be disputable. I want, I want for you to know, and I want for you to make the people know that I am the Lord your God. When you read on to verse 9 in that Exodus 6, it says the reason Moses was concerned about this and the reason Moses, Moses needed encouragement about this is because he was despondent and the people were despondent. Now listen to me. The people were despondent and he had become despondent with it. As a leader, you cannot reflect the attitude of your people. You must at reflect the attitude of your Lord. Whether your people are joyful or sad, you always carry as a wise leader the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells Moses, shape up your attitude. Moses says the people are despondent. They're, 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 he goes like, that's not the point. The point is you be the leader. You tell them my attitude. You tell them that I am the Lord your God. I will lead you. I will take care of you. I will take care of you. Pay attention to me. Moses had reflected the attitude of their people. Their people, listen to me, the people were faint-hearted. The leader cannot be faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted. We as spiritual mature believers have got to be those who encourage, console, bring them out of the mushiness of their head and bring them into a place of strength in the Lord, to tell them the Lord is your God. He is God Almighty. He can do these things. Give them the scriptures that they can put their faith in. This is what Paul is trying to, the background to all of Paul's discussion, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. You see, it's the idea, encourage the faint-hearted, is the idea of dealing with somebody who has lost heart. They've become despondent. They've become faint-hearted. It has the idea of becoming such over, so overwhelmed by the stressful circumstances of some specific aspect of your life that you've become distre distre distressed, depressed, and despondent in dealing with it. Isaiah 57 and verse 15 says, you've become lowly in your spirit. You've become lowly in your spirit. Now listen, let me show you the power of the word of God. Now listen to me, I want to show you the power of the word of God. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is active, sharper, powerful than a two-edged sword, piercing for, through the, the bone, the marrow, the joints. And, and listen, and here's the point. To become a critic of the intentions and thoughts of the human heart. The word of God. The word of God wants to get down where you live and become the counselor, the comforter that gives you the courage to step out of your closet and begin to live back in your full state. It gives us the, the, the power to be an encourager to the faint-hearted so that the faint-hearted can change to a strong-hearted. 
You see, there's a danger in faint-heartedness is where it can lead you. Where, 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 did, where can you go once you've bought into being faint-hearted? Where does it take you? Listen to this. Proverbs, 8th chapter, 14. The 15th chapter, 13 and 15 says, The spirit of man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? Where does faint-hearted go when it's got no place to go? It shrunk his whole world into a closet. I'll tell you where it goes, into a broken spirit. And that's where he gets suicides. And that's where you get, dis get no hope. We're to be encouragers to the faint-hearted. Listen, we need to lead them out of where they are. Not leave them where they are. If you leave them where they are, they'll become a broken spirit. Now, the antidote. The antidote seems simple. Be an encourager to the faint-hearted. It is a ministry of encouragement. It's a paramutheo mind. It's a, it's a ministry designed by God to stimulate, to stimulate by encouraging and consoling to correct one's thinking about his adversity of life. All they do is think about it all day, all night. They can't sleep. They can't eat. What do we call that? Faint-hearted. Now, when somebody is faint in his physical, he knows it. My wife said to me the other day, I want you to stay here with me just a moment. She was sitting on the side of the bed because I feel faint. I knew exactly what she meant. And I said, yes. And so we began to talk and I began to check. I checked her sugar, her blood pressure. You know, you, you do what you learn to do as a carekeeper. But she was talking about it physically. I could sit beside a person that has who's faint hearted and you know it. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? You need to be equipped the same way as if somebody says, look, I feel fainty. Well, what do you do? I mean, what do you mean? Been with my wife for a while. No, I know what that means. And I begin to do the, the bottom checks. And if it doesn't get proof, then I pick up 911. I pa I'm past my medical experience. What are we trying to bring them back to? We're trying to bring them back to a Romans 8.28. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring them back to a Romans 8.28. You know, where he can find the joy in his heart of his journey. God's got control of everything. And you know, he really does. In a split second of time, you can give the control back to him. How are you doing with it in your hands? You've shrunk your life into a clothes closet. How are you doing with yours? Listen, take your hands off from it. Give it back to God. Let me give you an example. In Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 25, 26, Jesus used an illustration of the widow of Zephar. This is found in first. In, in 1 Kings 17, 7 through 16, Elijah, Elijah, three and a half years, they were in a famine drought that was killing people. And the Lord told him to go to the widow of Zephar that she would take care of him. Now listen to that, would take care of him. When he got there, he asked the woman for a drink of water and something to eat. She was outside her house picking up sticks. She said, well, I'll tell you, sir, I'm picking up sticks to make a fire to make the last bread for me and my son to eat, and then we're going to die. 
the prophet told her that if he would share that with her, with him, invite him to dinner, that she would not die and that her house would always have food until the rains came back and she could have her garden again. She says, you must be a prophet. He said, indeed I am. He, en he encouraged the faint-hearted. The Bible goes on to say in verse 16, the bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke, through Elijah. That is the power of the ministry of encouraging the faint-hearted. Faint-heartedness reflects a failure of the faith cycle, especially on the application completion side. If you want a great example of this other than the widow, I've left a space and a discussion of David and Goliath, the story we all know about, but you can apply this idea to him because he became an encourager of the faint-hearted. The entire army of Israel, this great fighting force of God, had become faint-hearted. And this little shepherd boy took on Goliath and restored fighting courage in the army of Israel. It's well worth your read. It's well worth your read. Go back with me as I close to the face cycle at the bottom of your paper and let me show you how it worked with the widow of Zephar. When the prophet came, she heard the word of God. She heard it. Romans 10, 7, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. When she heard it, she believed it. Hebrews 4, 2. When she understood what he'd asked, she believed it. She believed it. And as a result, she went in and baked it, baked the bread and served it to the three of them, and they ate. That's the application. She thought it was her last meal. It was actually the beginning of a new chapter in her, in her life. Who would have ever dreamed that the story of Elijah and this widow would have been in the heart of Jesus Christ in Luke, the fourth chapter, when he preached in his hometown and was rejected? And says no prophet is accepted in his hometown when he probably will be honored in a foreign nation. And he used the story of the widow of Zephar in order to illustrate that point. How many widows of Israel did Elijah have to pass because they wouldn't listen to the word of God? They blamed him for everything. And yet this foreign widow, Gentile, believed. And her name is written in the covenant, new covenant book. In the heart of Jesus, she is remembered. The answer to this is God fulfills his promises. What we're carrying to people with faint-heartedness like the widow is the truth of the power of God through his word. She heard it, she believed it, she applied it, and she lived victorious because of it. I encourage you today to be an encourager of the faint-hearted. They have no way to go but down without you. Without you and I bringing the truth of the word of God and encourage them, consoling them, holding their hand and helping them understand the truth of the word of God, they will never make it. They will go from faint-hearted to a broken spirit. They will lock the door of the closet from the inside and die. They don't have to 
That is the word to the widow. You, it doesn't have to be that way. Our God is an awesome God. Our Lord is an awesome Savior. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today for your love and mercy and grace. I pray today, Father, we'd be encourager of the faint-hearted. I pray, Father, that we would understand that we can bring them out of the closet back into the living of their life in full bloom by the power of the grace of God. If we're today that faint-hearted person, be encouraged. What are you faint-hearted over? What is dominating your thinking pattern that you've allowed it to dominate you in such a way? What is your problem? In the back of your Bible is a concordance. Start looking up the scriptures that deal with it. If not, get online and call us. Go to some pastor that teaches the word of God that can give you some con consolation to your problem, that can console you can direct you to your faith system. That you could hear the word of God, believe it, apply it, and have it work in your life under Romans 4.21. What God has promised, he is able and willing to bring it to pass. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.